Would you turn with me to Daniel chapter 9, please? Daniel chapter 9. And turn this mic up a little, please. In Daniel chapter 9, we have been, well, not in Daniel 9, but we have been on uh, prophecy before we return back to the book of Romans. We either, we'll probably have one more week looking at prophecy. Um, Now, there has been beliefs and different accusations says those who look at prophecy get distracted from the real world and are unmotivated in their Christian faith. Even friends of mine that uh, I even heard um, Vishal Mangawaldi, who was set to come speak at our church, say such things, a brilliant Indian scholar, also uh, a guy I, I had the privilege of having dinner with and spending the day with, Eric Metaxas, said the, that the rapture itself is a distraction from the faith, and, and it's ridiculous. Um, the Bible is a third prophecy. In fact, a little more, it's about 27 to 29% prophecy. In fact, the way that we separate the different parts of the Bible is we have poetry, and we have uh, poetry, we have prophetic books, both in the Old and New Testament, though the New Testament, um, there's prophecy in many of the books. Oh, thank you, Layla. It's my daughter. I needed coffee before I'd share this with you today. And there's Matthew 24, and there's prophecy everywhere. The book of Revelation is a prophetic book. The Bible is is prophecy, all through it, all over it. And I believe a disinterest in these events um, not only is a disinterest in Scripture, it will not produce in you what it's supposed to produce, and that is to increase our faith. Jesus Christ would say, and and I'm repeating myself, I know when we study Ezekiel 38, one of the other reasons we've been discussing this is because what's happening with Israel. And, um, you know, I've gotten a a lot of people, as we would say, where I grew up, hating on me because of certain things that I've said about Israel. We stand with Israel, we pray for Israel, we believe in God's covenant with Israel, of course, we want everyone to be saved, and we want all people to hear the the gospel, both Jew and Gentile, but God has a special plan for Israel, and it's all throughout the scriptures. We studied Ezekiel 38 a couple weeks ago. So not only will not understanding and studying prophecy um, cause you not to be biblical, it'll, it'll take from you a part of the faith that prophecy is supposed to increase and put there. Jesus said in the Upper Room Discourse, I tell you these things in advance so that you might believe. That word believe, it is to trust, to have confidence in Jesus Christ. He would give prophecies in that Upper Room Discourse such as, I Tell you, the, I, Judas is going to betray me. The one who I dipped the bread and give it to, Judas betrayed him. Satan entered him, and he told both Satan and Judas, go do what you're going to do. Judas goes into an everlasting darkness, would hang himself before the sun rised. Uh, just prophecy is everywhere, but Jesus tells these things because he knows that we are finite. He knows how finite we are. And I want to, I got like two hours of preaching I need to get done in 50 minutes. So I want to give a prelude to this because we have a lot of visitors every time we have second and third service. Um, Jesus knows what's going to happen and and prophecy. So years ago, our finite minds, years ago I'm talking to a guy who was a very troublesome man in our church. I tried to reason with him. 
I tried, he, he, he was one of those types that was a friend to my face and was having secret meetings behind my back talking about how I don't believe in this, this, or that. And he would print um, the songs that we would sing and invite the young adults to his house doing an exegesis of the song and talking about how evil it was. That type of pettiness, all that stuff. And I'm talking to him, he says, I do not need to believe in the rapture of God's covenant with Israel to worship and serve him. That is not an incentive I need because I told him prophecy in part is so that we believe in God so that our trust in him increases. And I said to him, wow, you must be the only individual that God knew did not need 29% of the Bible. And, and listen, as sarcastic as that sounds, that was me being nice in that conversation that day. Because 1 John 3 says, he who has this hope, that is the imminent return of Christ, that's what 1 John 3 is talking about. He who has this hope in him purifies himself. This stuff is vitally important and immensely fascinating. And he who has this hope purifies himself Nobody in this room, I would venture to guess, has watched pornography with their mother. If you've watched pornography with your mother, raise your hand. No, don't do that. You don't do it. Why? Because the proximity. He who has the hope of the imminent return of Christ, he could come right now, will be face to face as he takes us up in the air. He purifies himself. He's anticipating the return. He's anticipating seeing him. And so with this stuff in Israel came out and I found out that Kenya was very far removed into believing news outlets such as Al Jazeera or BBC or CNN, it broke my heart. It broke my heart. And and so we've been dealing with this issue of prophecy. It's very important. And I hope after today's message... It will invigorate your faith and have you see Jesus Christ in a way that you may never have seen him before. So Daniel chapter 9, and the title of this message, I I don't do titles often, but I will. I'm trying to get more organized, guys. Is God's timekeeping. God's timekeeping. We are creatures of time. Time is a tool that runs our life and schedules and dictates events in, the, in history, in the present, and, in the, and will in the future is what we're talking about, uh, a prophecy. In fact, a Norwegian man was so meticulous and detailed, from a young boy, he kept, kept track of certain things that occupied his time. And when he was 80 years old, he pulled out his journal and calculated that he had spent five years of his life, you ready? Five years of his life waiting for other people. Apparently, he never lived in Kenya. He spent six months of his life tying neckties. He spent three months yelling at children. He was not a single mother or mother at all. And eight days telling dogs to lie down. That's what he calculated, 80 years old. And there's a lot more that occupies our time. We spend much of our lives sleeping. Telling time is important to us. In our modern age, we have the digital clock. We don't got to do much. But in the past ages, they had to do a lot. They had sand glasses or hourglasses where they created an apparatus that was a a glass bubble that went through a narrow glass tube into the same amount glass bubble. And you put enough sand in there, it takes exactly an hour. So you have the hourglass. Even before that, you had the sundial where they uh, determined the sun and its shadow and they determined what, what time of day is that. Before that, like the Incas and the Mayans and the Aztecs, they had water basins where they calculated exactly how much time it took to fill certain basins, and they created these water basins that could give them a 24-hour day. Fascinating stuff. Time is so fascinating that I went down a little bit of a rabbit hole that my wife 
asked me not to share with you today because it is so out there. You know, we live in a three-dimensional universe, so-called, three-dimensional. Just give me three minutes on this. Um, We live in this dimension that is three-dimensional that we based on length, height, and width. Albert Einstein came along and said there is a fourth dimension. He said time is a dimension. You can do length, height, and width, longitude, latitude, and, you know, uh, and determine where somebody is at one particular time, but they may not be there if you want to get exactly the time. See, we see in those shapes. We don't see in four-dimensional shapes. But Einstein figured out some of his equations by adding another dimension, time, and that's why and when he created the time-space continuum. Okay, I'll just stop there. Time's important. Um, Daniel 9 is about time, especially the prophecy of the 70 weeks. And it tells us about God's timekeeping, and he's never late. It tells us God has a clock. He has given us precise details about that clock, and it's in Daniel 9. And if you've never heard this study before, Just hold your socks, because your socks are going to blow right off of your feet before we're done. This is a monumental portion of Scripture. The Scripture is monumental for many reasons. Let me give you two. The word Messiah is first mentioned in Daniel chapter 9. It's never mentioned before this period of time. So it gives us not only a time clock for the nation of Israel, which controls the world... The nation of Israel and its time clock controls the rest of the world, just so you know. I taught you guys a couple weeks ago that when the Bible says north, it's referring to north of Jerusalem. When it says west, west of Jerusalem, east and south, you get the picture. Jerusalem is the center of the world in God's universe. Also, I learned recently, and this blew my mind and socks right off, that all languages east of Jerusalem are written from right to left, and all languages west of Jerusalem are written from left to right, making all languages converge upon Jerusalem. Fascinating. God has always planned that the Israelites would be the center of all world history concerning prophecy. So, we got God's time clock. Um, Daniel 9 is the backbone of all biblical prophecy. It grabs us in many ways in its scope and precision. The scope of a 490-year period and the precision of exact days of events that would happen. So let me give you the history before we get into this. Daniel is a young boy, some say as young as 13, some say 15, when he is led into captivity, the empire, the nation of Babylon, Israel in their disobedience, and we're going to talk about that disobedience, are taken captive. People like Ezekiel, taken captive. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we know them by their actual Babylonian names because this captivity is such a popular thing to Christians. And we It's mostly popular in terms of knowing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's name because they would refuse to worship the golden image and then they would get cast in the fiery furnace, but Jesus was in there with them, protecting them, and so on and so forth. But Daniel is this character. At 15 years old, he goes in, and before long, Daniel becomes the prime minister the prime minister of the Babylonian empire, the most powerful empire the world has ever known. The Babylonian empire in Daniel's vision in Daniel chapter two um, was more powerful as the head than it was its successors like the Medo-Persian empire, the Greek empire, and the Roman empire. They would become less in power until the time where you get that we live in is the feet where there is ten toes, um, ten nations. They haven't emerged quite yet. 
uh, but or 10 groups, however you want to look at that, there's different debate. But the point is, is Daniel is the prime minister of the most powerful empire the world's ever known, the Babylonian Empire. He's second in command when at first he was a slave. Well, he interprets the dreams. So he impresses the king, becomes the prime minister. Daniel died, presumably, in Babylon. And though it started at the beginning of the book with Daniel as a young man, Daniel is probably around 85 years old when he writes Daniel chapter 9. In the captivity of the nation of Israel and the Babylonian Empire, and guys, bear with me, I'm, I'm going to start opening up a fire hydrant of information and ask you to take a drink. You really got to engage your minds. We can understand this portion, the Bible, it's not perfectly understandable but it's simple to understand and what God's trying to get across. It really is. Even in the first service, I had people come up, be like, I wasn't getting the math. I'm almost there, so I'm going to put a chart up for you in a moment, not yet. So he's 85 years old, and he begins in Daniel chapter 9, verse 1, in the first year of Darius, the son of Asher. Asherius of the lineage of the Medes who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, please pay attention, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord. He even names the book through Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Then he set his face towards God and made confession, began to pray, said, Oh God, you're a great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and his mercies to those who love him with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and committed iniquity. And he'll go on in his prayer. So Daniel, he is not only the prime minister of the Babylonian Empire at a young age, but by the time he's 85, he would become the founder and president of an order that's called the Magi. It is the same Magi that would anticipate the exact or roundabout arrival of a baby in Bethlehem where a star would appear. And in um, Christopher, uh, I forget his last name's book, The Christ Comet, it is a comet as they studied the stars that would come and reside over Bethlehem. So he is the founder of that order. He's the one. So he is an astute student of Scripture. So much so that as he's reading the book of Jeremiah, he understands, according to Jeremiah chapter 29, I want to read it for you. Just two verses. Jeremiah 29 or one verse, verse 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to his place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope. Now imagine, These people were deported in three different waves of deportation, the nation of Israel, to Babylon. In 605 B.C., in 599 B.C., in 586, Daniel, knowing how to read Scripture as literal, would have started the time clock at 605 B.C. And as he's reading, because it was a famous day, it was a famous year, in the nation of Israel, that the first wave of deportation was in 605. And as he's reading Jeremiah 29, he says, here's the promise. God, through the prophet Daniel, has promised that we will only be in captivity for 70 years. And Daniel knew there was only three years left. He gave us the date in Daniel chapter 9 of when he's writing this. And he, he knows there's a few years left, three to be exact. And he 
And, oh, before I go on, listen. How was Daniel reading prophecy? Literally or figuratively? Literally. Now, I know there are brothers and sisters in Christ, but it amazes me that people take Daniel in the book of Revelation figuratively. It is a gross, glaring misunderstanding of Scripture. It is a... It, it, it is so neglectful that they prefer their own orthodox history and theology over the exact rendering of Scripture. They're amillennial. They believe in no millennium that Revelation describes. Some don't even believe in the rapture. Some don't believe in the seven-year tribulation period. And many either semi or quasi preterists I know I'm getting into some stuff, but follow me, that they actually believe, even good brothers in the Lord, I won't, I won't mention their name because I respect them, believe that the kingdom of God is already on earth as described in the book of Revelation. It's unfortunate that, that such things are believed. Not Daniel. Daniel believes in literal interpretation of prophecy. That's why he believes in the 70-year captivity of the nation of Israel. Also, it is a mistake to believe in figurative rendering of prophecy of Daniel 2. Because though we didn't know in Daniel 2 at that time, they didn't know about the Medo-Persian Empire, they didn't know about the Greek Empire, they didn't know about the Roman Empire, the very vision of Daniel gives us all of those empires, and those empires came to us. We need to look at this literally, including the 70 weeks that we're going to get into. So he looks at scripture literally. So what is he doing? He's 85 years old. He's reading Jeremiah. He's a very good student of scripture. And he says, wow, we only have three years left. And what does prophecy do? Does it cause him to be fatalistic? To just give up? No, it motivates him to pray. He goes down at the evening sacrifice and he begins to pray. And he's like, oh Lord, remember your promise. Remember your covenant with Israel. Remember your promise that you will bring us back into the land after 70 years. And then he asks for forgiveness for the sins of the nation of Israel. And he is talking about a very specific sin, which is the cause of the captivity in the first place. Do you remember back in the book of Leviticus, God gave a command the nation of Israel broke an agricultural command, and that's why they were led into captivity in Babylon. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then the land shall be kept a Sabbath to the Lord. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard, and gather its fruit. Guys, if you got ADD, you got to just tell your mind to pay attention. Six years you shall sow your field, and six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather its fruit. But in the seventh year, there shall be a Sabbath, a solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall neither sow nor, or, or in your field nor prune its vineyard. What's he saying? He's saying, hey, this is what my command is you in the land of Israel. Six years in the land, you can farm. On the seventh year, it's the sabbatic year. You give it a rest. For 490 years, the nation of Israel disobeyed God. Second Chronicles 36, verse 20. And those who escaped from the sword to be carried to Babylon where he became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the kingdom of Persia. To do what? Why were they led? To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. Second Chronicles. So what's going on? God told him six years of, of farming, one year of rest. For 490 years, they disobeyed, so God's taking back every year that they disobeyed, which is 70 years of disobedience, and that land is desolate, and it has 70 years of sabbatic rest. There are two major reasons God was so upset 
on why they disobeyed. And number one is the greater reason, and that is it defamed the rest that we receive in the cross of Jesus Christ. And secondly, and more inferior, but very important, they didn't trust him for their food. They worried. It's like, how can we let the land rest when we have so much crop coming in? We're making so much money and we have so much food. They didn't trust God. So he said, I'm going to allow you to be 70 years slaves in Babylon because you disobeyed. Daniel knows all of this. He knows all of it. And that's why he's reading Jeremiah. He says, three years more. And then he prays, Lord, remember your promise. You're good. Please forgive us for the sins that we committed. And then Gabriel comes to him. Let me read it. Verse 20, now while I was speaking, praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel. So Daniel's praying because he got excited about this prophecy. And presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, he looks like a man, but he's an angel, whom I had seen in the vision and began being caused to fly swiftly. Men don't fly, angels do reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you what? Skill to understand. Two words that should jump out at you right there. Skill and the word understand. This is not meant to be confusing. This is not meant for us not to understand. This is meant for us to have skill to understand as the angel Gabriel gave Daniel skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplication, the command went out and I have come to tell you for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. There are three archangels mentioned in the Bible. There may be more, but we don't know about them. You have Michael, who's the bouncer archangel. He's the muscle. He goes and fights Satan. You have Gabriel, who's the messenger archangel. He delivers messages like to Daniel, to Mary, and to Joseph. And then you have Lucifer, who is the supreme, or he was, excuse me, the supreme archangel who possibly was into music Um, Ezekiel 28, 13 could indicate that he did worship in heaven. Very beautiful angel. Still very beautiful, by the way, in his appearance. Daniel goes out at the time of the evening sacrifice. You know what's fascinating about this guy, Daniel? He's just a remarkable man. There's no temple in Babylon He understands temple worship and temple practices, and he understands the evening sacrifice, which the most important evening sacrifice is during Passover week when they would select a lamb, and on Friday they would would sacrifice that lamb at 3 p.m., which was the ninth hour. And what did the Pharisees try to prevent? They tried to prevent Jesus Christ to die so that he wouldn't look like the lamb, even though... Uh, they didn't believe he was. They said, we don't want him dying on Friday at 3 p.m. because that's the time of the evening sacrifice. And Jesus Christ died in the ninth hour on Friday, which is 3 p.m. because he is the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And that's when Daniel's praying. What a guy. What is he? A very astute student of scripture. He knows when to go out and start worshiping. Do you have your worship time? Every day with God. The prophecy is for the Jews. Now, let me read this to you, just the first part of that. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. This is where a lot of controversy comes in, and it is petty controversy because they do not, anybody in which is a minority, by the way, that believes this is not a 490-year period is just simply ignorant of Hebrew scripture. So, 
when Daniel is writing concerning the Gentile empires like the Babylonian Empire, Medo-Persian, uh, Greek, and Rome, when he's writing about these empires, he's writing about Gentile empires. And in Daniel 2, Daniel 7, and most of all of the scripture before Daniel 9, not all of it, but most of it, it is written in the modern language of that day, which was Aramaic. Daniel wrote in Aramaic because Aramaic was for the Gentiles. As soon as he begins chapter 9, he begins writing in Hebrew because Daniel 9 is for the Israelites. Seventy weeks are determined. That word determined means to cut off or to splice, to set aside. The word in Hebrew, 70 weeks, those two words is shabim shaboa. It is different words for other times when it was used um, in Hebrew. For example, the Hebrew language speaks of weeks of days, weeks of months, and weeks of years. And this is the word, Shabim Shaboa is weeks of years. It actually is literally translated, 70 weeks of seven years. Years. So much so is this the language in Daniel 9 that if you were sitting there with your a revised standard version of the Bible, it actually says seven weeks of years are determined. And if you're there with the new century version of the Bible, it actually says God has determined 490 years for the nation of Israel. Why? Because the Hebrew language tells us 70 weeks of seven years. That is the translation. This is translated in the Mishnah because that's the Hebrew language and the Jews do not believe in the Daniel 9 prophecy of the Messiah. That's the exact rendering. 70 weeks of seven years. So God has determined in the new century version of the Bible God has determined 490 years for the nation of Israel for six things. To finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Many of these are not, if not all but one, maybe two, have not been fulfilled. To seal up vision and prophecy... That hasn't been fulfilled. We still have prophecy that needs to be fulfilled. To bring everlasting righteousness. We didn't look into the news today and see a headline saying the world is now in everlasting righteousness. But there is one that has been fulfilled. And it goes on giving detail of that exact one. It's called the messianic time clock. It is the one that says to make reconciliation for iniquity. God knows what we needed. I love the quote that somebody said, if our greatest need would have been information, God would have sent us an educator. If our greatest need would have been technology, he would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need would have been money, he would have sent us an economist. If our greatest need would have been pleasure, he would have sent us an entertainer. But he knows our greatest need is forgiveness, so he sent us a savior. To to reconciliation for iniquity. Read with me further. And listen, it says in verse 25, no. And therefore, understand that from the going forth of the command. So he's going to give this what seems like a very complicated time clock. But it's not. He, he's saying, guys, know this. Uh, understand this. This is, you can get it. We're going to get it this morning. Don't leave until you get this. Okay? No and therefore understand that the, from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, that's one time period. 
until the Messiah, the Prince, second time period, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again and the walls, even in troublesome times. And after 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. The word cut means to pierce with holes. In the Hebrew word, to pierce with holes. The Messiah, after seven weeks and 62 weeks, shall be cut off. But for who? Not for himself. Doesn't that sound like Isaiah 53? He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. See, it is so powerful that Bob broke his chair. Don't worry, man. I broke one the other day. But I wasn't athletic enough, Bob, not to fall backwards. Good job. Guys, back it, listen. And by his stripes, we are healed. By his stripes. Sounds like Isaiah 53 when it says, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come, who is the people of the prince? Who is the people who cut him off? Who are the people who were in charge of the nation of Israel? That is the Roman people. They shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end shall be with a flood till the end of the war. Desolations are determined. So, we get these prophecies. He's going to go on talking about the last week. But for time's sake, listen. We got three periods of time. And I need you to to focus now. Because people get confused by this really easy. So, are you with me? We have 490 years, right? 70 weeks of sevens. Sheboim Shaboah. We have the exact detail that from the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem and its walls, there will be seven weeks plus 62 weeks. Seven weeks to rebuild Jerusalem and its walls, and 62 weeks plus the seven. Did I lose you? Before until the Messiah comes into Jerusalem to be cut off from his people. So, 70 weeks of seven years, seven times seven, so every week equals seven years. Let's do this. You have seven weeks. From the going forth of the command, they will rebuild Jerusalem and its walls. That's 49 years, right? Seven times seven, 49. Okay? We there. And then you add... 62 more weeks, it says right here. Look at it for yourself. That's 434 years. So from the time of the going forth of the command to rebuild Jerusalem after they leave captivity, there will be 483 years until Messiah comes into Jerusalem to be cut off from his people. 483 years, that's 69 weeks. Will you put up the chart? Because they're looking at me like I'm a, I'm, do, I'm a witch doctor here. Do you have the chart? Okay, I'll keep going until you get that chart up. There it is. It's not complicated. You see the beginning? 7 times 7 equals 49. It's connected to the 62. 62 times 7 equals 434. You add both of those, you get 483 years. Okay? Now, there was a guy named Artaxerxes. In command to go rebuild Jerusalem and its walls. And if you've studied Jeremiah you get the precision of Daniel 9 prophecy even in troubled times because Nehemiah and Ezra went through a terrible time rebuilding the walls and rebuilding Jerusalem. They had wars and they had threats and all these things going on. When did that happen? Oh, they kept record for us. It happened on March 14th, 445 B.C. March 14th, 445 B.C. So what do we do? You start the messianic time clock. 
There is a gentleman who did it in precise detail for us. His name was Sir Robert Anderson. He, at the time of writing his book, The Coming Prince, was the lead and head of Scotland Yard. He was a brilliant detective. And he wrote a book. If you want, as I heard a preacher say yesterday, if you want the cure to insomnia, start reading this book at night. And listen, he combined the Jewish calendar, which by the way, if you're sitting there trying to prove me wrong, 365 uh, days in a year, you won't get it right because the Jews don't have 365 days a year in their calendar. They have 360 day years on their calendar. So he combined the Jewish calendar with modern day calendar to get the modern day equivalent of when he came in and when Artaxerxes gave the command, and it was 173,880 days, 483 years, from March 14th, 445 BC. That's when he set the time clock, because that's what Daniel 9 says. And you can just leave that chart up for a minute, because they're still getting it. Leave it up. And listen, guys. Do you know what happened 173,880 days after Artaxerxes gave the command to rebuild the temple, which is seven and 62 sevens, 483 years, 173,880 days? Jesus Christ crested the Mount of Olivet and came into Jerusalem on a donkey on Passover week to be cut off from his people. Are your socks still on? Because you don't seem that... that that's crazy. That is the supernatural power of God. And the Bible is his word and it is infallible. That's a fact. In fact, it is such a reality, ladies and gentlemen, that maybe some of you have heard of the Qumran community. The Qumran community were people who lived down by the sea in, 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 near caves, and that's where in modern times we have found the Dead Sea Scrolls. Raise your hand if you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Anybody? Okay. Some of us. The Dead Sea Scrolls, ancient scripture. The Qumran community were absolutely prolific in Bible knowledge. They studied the Bible every day for hours from a child all the way up. And it has been re reported that the Qumran community, we have documents that said the Messiah is going to come in their generation and he's going to ride into Jerusalem and be cut off from his people. Like Daniel, the Qumran community were a student Bible stu students. And also... I believe there are other people in the New Testament that knew the Daniel 9 prophecy. Simeon could have been one of them, for he waited for what? The consolation of Israel. And when he saw Jesus Christ, he knew that he saw the consolation of Israel. Also, Anna said that she was waiting for the redemption of Israel. There were a remnant of people that knew the Daniel 9 prophecy. It explains why the Magi were able to pinpoint, along with other Old Testament prophecies, the baby being born in Bethlehem, and the star led them, because Daniel is the founder and was the president of the Magi who studied these scriptures. Can you imagine? Daniel didn't keep these things to himself. And ladies and gentlemen, when I was um, in an evangelical class, they taught us to learn Daniel 9 for the sake of sharing the gospel with people because of its precise accuracy. Is this not amazing? Is this not our God? And you know what? Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, look at this. The very day that Daniel prophesied, the very day that Daniel prophesied, Jesus comes riding in on a donkey and it says in verse 41, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. Luke 19, 41. 
And he says, if you had known even you, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. He's also mentioning the prophecy in Daniel 9 saying Jerusalem was going to be destroyed by those who cut off the prince, which is the nation of Rome. In 70 AD, the nation of Rome destroyed Jerusalem. And listen, this is the best part. You guys ready for this? Are you ready? It's like a roller coaster ride for me. Because you didn't know the day of your visitation. I believe with all my heart, Jesus, in his infinite love, is making a direct reference to Daniel 9, saying, I loved you enough to tell you exactly when I was coming. And you don't know the day of your visitation. You weren't ready for me. You'll be cursed. Jerusalem will be destroyed again because you didn't know when I was coming. You should have known. You should have been waiting. You should have been anticipating. You should have believed in my coming to be cut off from my people to make reconciliation for iniquity. You should have known. Isn't that fascinating? And to bring some application to this, I want you to turn with me to Matthew 16, verse 1 through 4. The Bible says, Then the Pharisees and Sadducees came, testing him and asking him, Show us a sign from heaven. Show us a sign from heaven. How ignorant. How wicked, how rude of them to ask Jesus Christ for more signs. In fact, he would say it. When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites! You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. In other words, prophecy is more knowable than the predictions of weather. And we know how often the weathermen get it wrong when they predict rain. (laughs) You know how to discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the signs and the times. What are the signs and the times? What is he talking about? The signs of the times of the messianic time clock. I'm here. You don't know who I am. I told you I was coming. And then he says, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, but no sign will be given to them except the sign of the prophet Jonah. He's still going to come with the sign of the resurrection. As Jonah was three days, three nights in the belly of the fish, so the Son of Man will be three days, three nights in the belly of the earth, and he'll rise again. Wicked, perverse generation. In Luke chapter 16, I won't go there for a time, but Luke 16, there is a real story, I believe, of what happens after a rich man and Lazarus die. Lazarus begged for the rich man. The rich man wouldn't give him food. He begged at the gate of the rich man every day. They both die. He goes to Abraham's bosom. The rich man goes to a place of waiting, Hades, where there's torment and gnashing. And he starts to talk to Abraham. He says, Abraham, please come give me some water. He says, no, I can't cross. He says, then... Go tell my family about this place. And something very important, Abraham says, even if one were raised from the dead, they would not believe, for they have Moses and the prophets. They have prophecy. They have prophecy. If they can't believe in Daniel 9 prophecy, They're not going to even believe if somebody's raised from the dead. (laughs) 
I mean, guys, if chills, doesn't, if chills hasn't gone up your spine and neck at least one time during this study, then you need to just, just get born again, actually. I'm joking. Why isn't God paying my school fees? I know it can be hard. I understand it's tough. Actually, I don't know. I can't relate to all that you go through. Why did God have to let my son die? My mother, my father, my brothers, my sisters. Why did that person have to abuse me? Why? I know it's tough. I've been abused before. I know it's hard. But don't blame God. And don't try to minimize a sign from God as arbitrary as getting 20,000 shillings when he has given you every sign you ever need to trust and believe in him. Amen? Guys, this, this stuff is so exciting. When I was first, you know I had read Luke chapter 19 a hundred times. And years ago, when I was teaching the triumphal or tearful entry, I started reading a commentary, and I didn't really believe it at first. And then I started searching Daniel 9, and I spent about three hours, and finally when I was convinced this is what it's saying, guys, it was like I was a little kid. I was in my room alone studying, and I started dancing in my room. Have you guys... I mean, we dance and music, and I I increasingly love Kenya more and more because I think our weddings are the best in the world. But man, I am fascinating at the different dance. This isn't a part of the sermon, really, but you, you know, there's a certain age where young people, they're just like, the old man Kenyan dances. And you know what? He's barely moving, but he looks so cool when he does it, doesn't he? He's like, I'm not young anymore, but I still like to move. I was in my room. I jumped out of my seat. I was like, what does it do to us? What does it do to you? Does it increase your faith in the word of God? I surely hope so. I, I surely hope so because this is God's word and he loves us so much that he gives us details Don't think God is not listening to your prayers. He is so detailed that he'll give us the exact day of when Jesus comes into Jerusalem to die on the cross. Passover week. Let's bow our heads in prayer. As the worship team comes up. Lord, truly there is no other God like you. Nobody can transcend time to tell us exactly how time will play out because you are in control of your creation. Nobody can stop your plan. And I thank you for it, Lord. With you guys' heads bowed, I want to give the opportunity. Some have been doubting maybe the word of God or you're backslidden or even not born again. I want to give you an opportunity to, to... to raise your hand to be prayed for in just a moment. Lord, I pray you'd pour out your Holy Spirit that those who have heard your word today and who are amazed by it, who are not walking with you or backslidden would be born again right now. Anybody who wants to receive Jesus Christ or come back from your backslidings, please just raise your hand right where you sit and I'm gonna pray for you right now. Anybody in this room, just raise your hand. Yes, yes, yes. Anybody else, raise your hand to receive Jesus Christ. He is the word of God and the word of God is true and without error. Anybody else, raise your hand. It's amazing. We're not even playing melodious music to make you raise your hand here. Thank God. I'm gonna pray for everybody raising their hands. Please keep them raised. Lord, I pray for everyone raising their hand right now. So many of them, Lord, so many. I pray that you would bless them. I pray 
that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon them. Give them peace, the very peace. It says you would be cut off from your people, but not for your sake. It was for our sakes. And it was for the sake of every person in this room who's raising their hand right now and every person in this room who's born again. So I pray you would pour out your spirit on those raising their hand and fill them with the joy of salvation, Lord. That they may confess with their mouth and believe in their heart that you are the Christ and that God raised you from the dead and in confessing and believing, they will be saved. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Guys, the Bible talks about confessing before men. It's important we see you. Raise your hand. Those who raise their hand, lift them up so we can see you. Here, there, there. God bless you guys. Thank you. And please go to that Connect station. Sign up as a new believer. We're going to call you this week. We're going to give you materials. If you've never taken the new believers class, this is the last week to sign up because I think it starts this coming week. It's starting this coming week. God is moving. Why? Why is God moving? Because his word is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Amen.